Hello everyone, today we talk about the military exploit of the Mousquetaire de la Maison du Roi, the famous musketeers of the guard, uh, most notorious for Alexander Dumas novels rather than the actual military history, unfortunately, at least for those who are not particularly obsessed with uh, the French army, Fr French military culture, which, as you know, we are gradually trying to expand on, especially as far as modern, contemporary era. Um, these are specials aimed specifically at structuring this awareness, uh, say, strengthening already the pretty interconnected fabric of military history that we uh, provide uh, on Schwerpunkt. So a brief introduction to the Mousquetaires de la Garde that were established by Louis XIII in 1622, originating from an existing cavalry unit called the Carabon, so equipped with carbines, which uh, was however, now supplied with muskets, hence the name Mousquetaire, they acted as the Royal Guard, uh, initially, essentially, outside the royal residences were the, probably the, the, the French Royal Bodyguard and the uh, Swiss Guards existed. The Musketeers performed duties both on foot and horseback. In fact, they were tactically complete, uh, while their distinctive uniform signified their loyalty to the king, and in that particular moment of French history, as you know, their Catholic roots during the Huguenot uprisings. So, signing, of course, to the royal cause against the Protestants, as is also shown by their insignia. In following their creation, a second company under Cardinal Richelieu was formed, but was later dissolved by his successor, Cardinal Mazzarino, who reinstated it in 1657. By 1664, the Musketeers had been reorganized into two distinct groups, the Grey Musketeers and the Black ones. Membership was esteemed, mainly reserved for the nobility. However, due to financial issues, they were dissolved by Louis XVI in 1776, and although they were re-established in 1789, they were once again disbanded following the French Revolution. Finally, after a brief revival occurred in 1814, the Musketeers were permanently disbanded. Two years later, I inserted some pictures of in fact, the uniforms of the Musketeers de la Maison du Roi to illustrate this chronological transformation, because you don't often think of the Musketeers uh, in a in a very different way from in fact the one of cloak and dagger, but they in fact existed for an importantly long time and up to the essentially the Napoleonic era, aside from the fact that they pertain to the French monarchy and not the Empire, etc. But they of course adapted in those years to the to the uh, the practicalities. Uh, of of the relative warfare. So when we look at the king's musketeers, we are looking essentially at a exemplifying single defining trait. That is the spirit of a warrior. His ancien regime, un elite unit, was in a great sense embodying that in a developing France that was establishing essentially the, the true first uh, national army modernly meant right a, a quite interesting blend as all, uh, that turns out to be effective as always between tradition and modernity imagine a world in which essentially wherever you go you have essentially a scenery and ability uh, we know how hierarchically stratified the French one was, given the size of the country, uh, the, the immensity of its power. I made a video about, uh, especially the 18th century French officer's appointment uh, dynamic, and what the problem of these men really were there, were, there was essentially a backbone of small 
nobility that made the entire French royal army work, then there were the bourgeois pushing for entering the business for the relatively uh, remunerative uh, career, not much through the commissions, but through the status that could arrive, through social promotion, etc. And a higher nobility was increasingly detached from those uh, traditional historical military lifestyle and that was provided in fact with the highest command but also not having um, this intense uh, I mean the royal army was very capable so at a very high level we're talking about a very uh, very strong military culture and more but some of the issues that eventually led also to, to the French Revolution had to do with this increasing uh, oligarchization uh, of the system so the detachment from the weakening of the connection uh, between the elite, the ultra elite essentially, and the very fabric of the military. And in many ways, the potential that this had that was not being backed, however, with uh, the the resources that a larger uh, representational capacity could could bring on the table. But by contesting for the authority, that was a bit always the the actual. Uh, contrast existing within the, the the system. However, the musketeers uh, incarnated also such loyalty, in fact, to the monarchy. The belief that, of course, this uh, core could essentially allow for, in great part, this uh, regeneration uh, of uh, the to at the top, like the, the closeness to the king, the uh, let's see, the, the relatively open uh, possibility of entering the musketeers uh, and the, the the great youth, for example, of the the members at the same time, and the fanatic courage and, and prestige uh, that they they acquired in the world. Right from their initial encounters, each musketeer earned a fierce reputation for incredible courage. Courage is not everything. In war, it's just like the basis. But this was already like exceeding him in certain circumstances. We'll have to understand even the customs of, of the times, what it meant to be a soldier, say, in the mid-70s, as opposed to, to the mid-18th uh, century. Really, a lot... Of things had changed. Uh, consequently, the musketeers are uh, facing a considerable risk of injury or that they are elite units, but for this reason they are meant to participate in the great battles, in the great sieges, as we'll see now with uh, varying results, depending mostly on, on, the, on the performance of the general army. The same musketeers did suffer some uh, debacle, but also in that case for just like the accidents uh, of war. Uh, so that when we look at the their motivation, especially in the earlier times, the allure of battlefield glory in itself proved irresistible. right? Especially as many musketeers were, as, as we said, extremely young, just in their late teens or early 20s, which also surprised the enemies, as we'll see. Uh, in that age, uh, a young soldier often feels indomitable. There are some things that you can only make uh, soldiers of that age do. That, say, a 30-year-old would say, okay, slow down, let's think about it twice. Uh, that's why they, they fully incarnate that sense of war-bending um, experience, uh, camaraderie, and uh, exasperate heroism for which many of these uh, young men died uh, and also a consistent part, however, brought to an enormously appreciated military experience. Consider they were mostly of noble blood to begin with, so they had been indoctrinated uh, into that thinking simply from the day that they were born and before, um, arguably, uh, because it, it just lived in, in their blood. Right, it lived in the tradition of their families. This was a post of again enormous prestige. They they were present at court. They they had 
various tasks next to the strictly military ones. In fact, this video is to, um, as, as much as I love myself, Dumas' work, um, to restore a bit the more accurate uh, idea of the musketeers, not much the their sort of adventures and sort of uh, intelligence, counterintelligence, uh, conspiracies, uh, plots, and so on, but um, in rivalry, and all that was true, right? It, it's not just the a fabrication of of uh, fiction; it's really contextualized in in a time which with this was quite obvious. For example, the rivalry between the King's Musketeers and the Cardinals one it was an actual thing. They they it was part of the of the tough necessity of given the the internal institution of, of a an expanding realm. In fact uh, uh, a tough time to again toughen themselves further uh, in the process. In a time in which also justice was still very much, um, you know, ad personam as much as this political and military exploit. However, the principal task of these troops was also to participate to major engagements, and that's what they were trained for uh, to begin with. In fact, the same idea of the swordsman is actually betrayed by the same term musketeer that of course referred to the fact that by that point essentially their their greatest capacity laid in firepower which they mastered pretty well through massive collective training um and uh, you know man maneuvering and 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 combined arms for at least the the first century of their existence as the pike took a while to fully disappear in fact when we look at the military record of the musketeers, but also more in general, uh, the the French military annals, we realize that each campaign included, of course, many um, many engagements uh, for which a musketeer had to stay constantly alert as part of the contingent task with safeguarding the king among his troops all throughout these. Uh, these operations. Moreover, a musketeer was not merely a protector. All right, he was often called to spearhead assaults at the front line as part of a large elite force. We will see now abundant examples of this. We can start from the siege of La Rochelle in 1627-28. As you know, there were many sieges of La Rochelle. It was the great Protestant stronghold in France. Uh, perpetuating that sort of bizarre twist for which, of course, like the, the South, and in particular this Atlantic side of it, was um, particularly, uh, say, intolerant of the, uh, the French market, also because technically they were another nation, where Occitanians weren't French, and they were being engineered as such. But as we've seen also in the video about the French wars of religion, most of that had, Protestantism had concentrated there, in part for this reason, like, the world northeast of France was the center of the kingdom was staunchly Catholic. Uh, it could be reached by the English uh, from uh, by by sea. In fact, uh, they would routinely receive. In fact, this this English troops to counter uh, the Catholic forces. And at a certain point, the monarchy is fed up. You know that there were all these various edicts uh, of Nantes that went on even after. At the end of say the, the narrowly as conventionally defined period of, of, of the wars of religion at the end of, of the 16th century and it was finally revoked as an edict of tolerance towards the Protest, uh, toward the Protestants by Louis the fourteenth um, however not before this uh, in fact Protestant force was crushed in a strictly military sense France at this point, the 20s of the 17th century, still a, a large feudal country, right? It, the great reforms, it, admittedly, as we've seen also in other videos, uh, for example, the Battle of Freiburg, um, there what Turenne and Condé managed to do, but what kind of quality the French infantry already 
was at that point realized that there was a lot of state building going on but it, it, the country in itself is still somehow parceled you can control everywhere uh, it's an enormous country to begin with very populous very prosperous um, and so these wars help to put things uh, in the right order uh, the seizure of Arusha was massive, right? And this is, in fact, were the first significant musketeers. Ba I'm saying musketeers, you understand the royal musketeers here, of course, occurred during the protracted and complex siege of 27-28. Of Nearby La Rochelle on the Ile de Ré, Protestant forces surrounded the French royal garrison, prompting a relief mission that involved the king's musketeers. They fought bravely, on foot, compelling the enemy to withdraw. However, the siege offered few chances really for individual distinction. It was mostly like a, an attritional operation. Um, uh, and so uh, non-elite troops were better spent there. So that after La Rochelle capitulated, King Louis XIII and Cardinal Richelieu reoriented the French army to the east so that in 1629 we find uh, another important and here much more uh, better documented but also just uh, uh, glorious action of the musketeers at the Pas de Suze. That is to say, the Sousa Pass, that is basically the main way from France into Italy, and that, as you know, at this point is contended between France and Savoy. We, we talked about that Alpine warfare also as far as the uh, the Valdensian uh, resistance against the French uh, was uh, concerned. So, uh, mostly during the War of the League of Augsburg. So we're talking. Uh, almost um, 60 years later, but to, a testament to the relentless, of course, guerrilla. And for here, it's it's different. We're fighting against Savoy, uh, that at a point was also, in fact, helping the French against the Valdensians. But it, it's it's a complicated story. But that involves, in fact, this um, dramatic uh, strength in uh, mountain warfare and during the terrible sieges. The Sousa Pass was obstructed uh, at Sousa, in fact, herself. And once more, the king of France commanded his musketeers to participate this time as a forlorn hope unit, a really bold undertaking. The Sousa Fortress was actually a great place to try to bog the French army in preventing uh, it from going through the narrow alpine route uh, in, in Piedmont. As you know, this area had been historically hegemonized by the French, at least uh, the, still today, which is rare, like in other countries' borders, you find that the, Al the, the watershed of the Alps lays disproportionately from the, um, from the French side. Right, because since Frankish Longobard times, the Franks were the stronger force. This was different, for example, from the Bava Bavarian side. Uh, and the French naturally had always seen Italy as a sort of just um, continuation, basically, of their private possessions. Very typical, more than royal, actually imperial culture that the French always incarnated to, to a degree that really rivals with, with the German one at some point, sort of. Uh, f fell short of it uh, of the same. Um, the uh, point here strategically is that the French were trying to align with with a Spanish contingent, uh, whatever. But the regarding the musketeers, uh, on the morning of March the sixth, again in sixteen twenty nine, King Louis the thirteenth makes the crucial choice to proceed through the Sousa Pass which was de defended by around 2,700 Piedmontese soldiers. Their leader was the Count of Verru, um that stated, you, you know that Piedmont, the Savoy, were essentially at least the ruling dynasty was 
francophone. They were, they were French in, in practice. Uh, at this point in history, they actually still controlled Savoy. It is on the other side. I made a video of, uh, about medieval Savoy. Uh, for the troops were largely um, Italians instead, but you have, you have plenty of these French names. And uh, the, the Count of Aru stated that the French would be facing more formidable opponents than the English forces they had encountered at the previous siege of La Rochelle. Because objectively the Piedmontese were pretty tough, sturdy, rough people that would prove sort of that militaristic reputation, not just through the Italian unification, but through many examples during, uh, during this in fact, previous century's history from the Crimean War to the this, this incredibly also stubborn and very uh, infantry defensive base uh, approach uh, that would inform to to an extent later also the, the Italian military doctrine because it was designed in fact to fight in in the Alps. There are some beautiful battles in in, in this scene about the ascent was a uh, clamorous Piedmontese victory over the French. There are lots of beautiful pages of military history that we document, including this one, where, however, the French, thanks to the musketeers, covered themselves in glory. The Sousa Pass was strongly fortified with extensive field works, consisting of about 30 redouts, accompanied by two lines of barricades that were each roughly 12 feet thick and 20 feet high. This is really typical, again, of the for a fortificatory landscape of this specific part of Europe uh, at this time in history. And uh, King Louis XIII and Cardinal Richelieu, that were literally directing the operation, prepared to launch an attack to seize the field works and secure the town of Sous, which is also like the imperative here, like they had to break through, so yes, it costs whatever, but uh, that's it. There is a synchronized two-pronged assault planned to target both sides of the first Piedmontese barricade at the same time. It's probable that the, uh, the, the Piedmontese themselves wore blue sashes to identify um, themselves, while the French, the white ones, which is interesting because at, still at this time, we're in 29. You see, we recently made a video about the Swedish uniforms of the Thirty Years' War that, um, you know, is a topic mostly related to the idea that uh, it's only at that point that modern uniforms really appeared. But in many ways, um, yes, the, uh, the degree of uniformity had always existed, but it could change, like in this case, and some signs of recognition could be just very much ad hoc, right? Um, and um, the, the musketeers from the French side were the, again, the royal musketeers, we're not talking about the arm of the musketeers, save, you know, specific reference, would be easily distinguished by their distinctive cassocks. At six o'clock in the morning, the French and the Swiss guard infantry, because the Swiss, again, until the French Revolution, as you know, were, we said it before, were probably like this, some of the historical guards, which is true for the Pope, etc., uh, for many monarchs in Europe along with 48 companies of French line infantry, moved towards the barricade defended by the Piedmontese. The king instructed his musketeers to dismount and join the ranks of the 120 enfants perdus. These were, as you know, the lost uh, children, essentially the forlorn hope uh, unit from the, f the same French guards, boosting their attacking force to over 200 men spearheading the attack and interestingly split into two groups to assault both flanks at once. Uh, so these are the elite of the elite, so some kind of suicide forces that some of the musketeers are allowed to join. This is the first episode of that um, hyper-aristocratic fanatism that characterizes the French military at this point. This is properly the time of, of those kind of displays, right? You have, I don't know, the, um, the Venetian sailors under fire crossing the, the Bosphorus, um, 
you know, all in, you know, parade dress, uh, facing the Turks, like saying, you know, showing a, a massive middle finger to them. You have, um, again, the lace, makeup, but also massive bats of blood that show you this enormous attributes, of course, these these troops had. And it, it's still a knightly world. It's still, it's still a medieval uh, way of, of war and this is incredibly important to stress Medi- medieval warfare dies in Europe only between 1792 and 1918 nine, uh, 19, depending on where you look at because in the aside from the strictly military issues like the, the, so the technical ones that people tend to get distracted by in, in the political and social fundamentals haven't changed since the middle of the ages at all right and so these troops here, the, the musketeers, the enfants peur du, are basically to guide uh, the assault, to um, to make the entire action depend on them. In fact, which which kind of here there is the king uh, of France, there is the cardinal. It, it, it's all planned to uh, to be a, a matter of major international relevance. So the, all the eyes of Europe and beyond are pointed uh, on this man. And and this, that in fact, despite coming under heavy enemy fire, they managed to charge at the barricade with resolute determination. What happened there is quite crude, right? There weren't many ways to uh, break through the barricade, but literally just with, with your bodies, like coming on top of one another, uh, right? Biting, kicking, stabbing, all this kind of stuff under fire in the midst of uh, the musketry, uh, smoke, uh, clouds, etc. So um, the, the Piedmontese are taken by surprise by the sheer ferocity of the assault, by the sheer moral forces that these men express. While the forlorn hope from the French guards attacked on the right flank, the king's musketeers and uh, Lieutenant de Treville launch a vigorous push against the barricade on the left flank that um, had been spotted as weaker uh, and taking down everything in their path. And within minutes, the enemy retreated on both sides, allowing the supporting French troops to overflow the field works. This was a feat of massive bravery and resistance. Eventually, the French succeeded in capturing the outer force of Sous, uh, followed by the town uh, itself. And so close behind all this, there were literally the king, the cardinal, and f- in fact, one of the latter's guards was struck by enemy fire during the unfolding battle, showing how risky that position really was for such important... It was the prime minister of France, right? Um, and they observed the scene as a particularly... Courageous King's Musketeer distinguished himself uh, in the fight. After the Thirty Years' War, significant events took place for the King's Musketeers. After their ring statement in 1657, they advanced into northern France further. True to expectations, the Musketeers exhibited remarkable courage, especially during the Battle of the Dune. In 1659, they fought to defend northern France. True to expectations, they exhibited remarkable courage, especially during the Battle of the Dunes in 1659, when they successfully thwarted four cavalry charges from the enemy, gaining the notice of the Spanish forces. The king's musketeers were involved in all major sieges, of the War of Devolution and notably stormed and captured a section of Lille's fortifications in just 15 minutes during the 1667 siege. And the following day, when the Flemish city surrendered and its governor was taken aback to discover that many of the musketeers were merely 17 or 18 years old. Admittedly, in that era, such age corresponded to a much greater maturity than today's, both under a psychological and even physical point of view, because people matured literally earlier in a biological sense. Uh, 
However, this is not just about courage, right? What the fact that at that age you can fundamentally do. This is about the skill, the technicalities that still must be owned and possessed in order to allow such potential to, to be expressed. So this speaks of, again, an excellent military training of the king's musketeers. In 1668, around 40 of the king's musketeers led an assault at Dole in the Franche Comte, successfully taking an outer fortification of the enemy. At this point, French infantry is really toughening up. Uh, there are other uh, armies in Europe, that were the ones fighting against the same Louis the Fourteenth, that uh, given their smaller uh, armies and also the proximity uh, to, to the same aggressive France, such as Holland, uh, are working. I made a video on, on this and the doctrine uh, of firepower, especially uh, between the, the French, the, the Dutch, um, and the English at that point, that essentially followed the latter's model, um, was uh, escalating essentially together with the same intensity of warfare, the size of armies, uh, etc. But it is true, and again, we've seen it at Freiburg, I was saying it before, how the French had by this point developed essentially the most, like really the fiercest standards of, uh, say, infantry, uh, warfare since the the demise or at least the decline of the Tercio that they had themselves contributed under Condé to to demolish um, and that uh, are displayed in this fanatic frontal assaults taking an incredible amount of losses right once that today would simply destroy a unit and that at the time were considered not only acceptable but still allowed you know, for for that unit to keep on fighting, even multiple days, it's something utterly insane. I would like actually to research this further. At Dole, the same commander of Freiburg's uh, assaults, the Prince of Condé, leading the French army, noticed uh, the let's say the the important uh, resistance and uh, swiftly called for infantry reinforcement, resulting in the town surrendering. Uh, the next day, had remained quite impressed by the aforementioned 40 musketeers during the capture of that uh, redoubt, and so swiftly called for infantry reinforcement resulting in the town surrendering the next day. There is also an unusual deployment uh, when the Sun King sends a hundred musketeers to support the Duke of Beaufort's campaign against the Turks in Candia on the island of Crete in 1669. This was the year one of the single most uh, heroic sieges in the entire history of mankind. Uh, Candia was a Venetian stronghold that had endured an Ottoman siege or blockade since, in, since 1646. And so for, for over 20 years, the Venetians resisted in, in an indescribable way. Um, and uh, the French decided to, to participate for reasons now we will... We'll talk about it in another video, all the sort of political diplomatic issue behind this. Um, and this is also the time in which, in fact, the, the French w wouldn't be able to control this irresistible aristocratic um, taste for adventure. Uh, as you know, the, the French were fundamentally backing the Ottomans against the Habsburgs, but uh, many noblemen had pressed for helping the, the Venetians. This incident, if we can so call it, aside for the fact that this would be a notorious disaster for the French, brought, and we saw it in the series about the 1683 siege of Vienna, uh, on, that, on the latter occasion to preemptively reassure uh, for the, the French to reassure the Ottomans regarding the fact that there would have not been, in fact, French volunteers. Um, this would have been this played also the Battle of Saint Gotthard, uh, when in fact there were sort of pretty multinational force to repel the Ottomans that saved Vienna twenty years before. Um, so it's just actually a few years uh, before the same uh, Cretan 
expedition. We've seen it also in the series about Prince Eugène, as he was one of those very French, Italian French, in that case, noblemen that left because they wanted to fight against the Turks at Vienna. And that brought actually to his alienation from from France uh, and, uh, and to his uh, say, uh, enormous Asbergic uh, future, since he was essentially the greatest commander in Asbergic uh, history. Um, so the French go to uh, Candian, 1669, uh, with Louis XIV's blessings. Um, following the Knights of Malta's interception of a convoy that carried part of the Sultan's treasure and harem on its return to Constantinople after the pilgrimage to Mecca. This particularly tricked the, the Turks, as you can imagine. Uh, in fact, they made it a point to, uh, to take revenge uh, of, of, of the French, and of course also of the, of, of the Maltese Knights, etc. And in 1669, around 40,000 Ottoman soldiers were stationed around, uh, around Candia, the siege had really been terrifying, and it had managed, it would mark actually the same decline of Venice and Italy as, through that, as a, an actual superpower at the end of the 17th century. Um, but it, it also, because Candia was finally taken by the Turks, but at, at a devastating price. I mean, the Ottoman Empire was bled white, basically the other uh, big shot they managed to achieve was uh, Vienna to that. I mean, to carry out, say better, was Vienna 1683. It also made a great part of their possessions collapse, as we will see also uh, in some videos I'm preparing. Uh, and the Venetians to come back for that matter, uh, also in Greece and, and so on. And just imagine that the, say, the, the Islamic precepts of helping the 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 defenseless, like the the widows, the orphans, through the alms as a duty, um, in, in their religion was uh, was suspended because of how ma many resources had to pour into the siege of Candia. It was an utter bloodbath in every sense. A general call for help was issued, by the way, to to a European course, and that's why Louis the Fourteenth that as many uh, French uh, rulers had, of course, maintained under cowardice, however also pretty notorious, um, coordination, uh, if not alliance with, with the Turks, had to, to respond, because this was still the age in which um, that chivalry and that sense of crusade were still incredibly alive, in especially in front of what the, really the Venetians were managing to pull off that was nothing out of the extraordinary. Now, in June of, of 1669, a French naval force arrived with 6,000 soldiers. But the Ottomans initiated intense attacks ag uh, against uh, the, the Christian forces, nevertheless. Despite this, the king's musketeers managed themselves to fend off the Ottoman cavalry during a sortie, although they incurred the losses of two dead and 32 injured. The French reinforcements encountered several challenges, such as a rampant plague, uh, the accidental explosion aboard uh, a 58-gun warship that was sort of pretty embarrassing as well, and, and the final death of the same Duke of Beaufort in, in battle, so the commander of, of the French expedition. As a consequence, the morale of the garrison, now down to just 3,600, albeit very capable troops that had been hoping that, that the major power uh, in Europe would be able, in fact, to provide such a, an important support, uh, fell drastically. As a result, uh, when the Ottomans promised safe passage for all Christians from Candia, the city finally surrendered after more than 20 years on September the 27th. Uh, and a musketeer returning from such an experience would, of course, have a lot of you know, fascinating 
stories to tell, except also pretty bitter ones considering the general misfortune that the French contingent in particular um, suffered during the campaign. In 1672, when war was declared against Holland, this is the Franco-Dutch war that would last until 1678, the king's musketeers crossed the Rhine, quite symbolically, on June the 2nd. As you know, the Sun King was pretty much involved into essentially the hegemonization of the Rhineland. Many Protestant German princes supported him against the, the Habsburgs, uh, and many great sieges were carried out at this point. One of the more uh, glorious, right, in, in the pages of French military history. By June uh, 1673, the French army was laying siege to Maastricht with the aid of a British contingent sent by King Charles II, that, as you know, was not just uh, related to Louis XIV, but was backed as a crypto-Catholic after the general resettlement, in fact, the, the restoration uh, after the uh, the English Civil War. We'll talk about that from also in some video soon. Now, the siege of Maastricht, for those who love uh, the Three Musketeers and especially uh, are aware of the real figure after which, in fact, uh, D'Artagnan is modeled, uh, is uh, the place where the latter character actually dies. Right? It was the Captain Lieutenant D'Artagnan that, together actually with the other the three musketeers, who was of course the fourth in the story, uh, did all actually exist, right? This is also the only... There are many actual his historical references, real characters in Dumas' work uh, that are very interesting to look at. Um, and the three musketeers are actually all existing figures um, at the head of the king's ones, right? Uh, D'Artagnan is the only one whose name is essentially re accurately literally reported the others are relatively modeled but they're basically the same i don't know armies is um our myths and this kind of stuff another beautiful coincidence is that in the british contingent fighting for the french in the siege was the young john churchill who would go on to become of course one of britain's greatest generals to say at least who would have thus known D'Artagnan? Charles de Bats de Castelmort was his name. He was known as D'Artagnan. He was born between 1611 and 1615 in Castelmort, Gascony. All of these, uh, the, these four uh, fr uh, from, from the, the, the novel actually come from the Pyrenees. And, and, and they actually do on the basis of the actual characters that were from there, so that that's accurate. Um, D'Artagnan dies uh, on June the 25th, 1673, during the siege of Maastricht. Despite his legendary status, much of what is known about the real D'Artagnan comes from dubious memoirs published long after his death, which were altered by Gatien de Courtelie de Saint-Ras. Nevertheless, the historical figure is real and thus also that uh, relevant at the head of, of the musketeers. D'Artagnan was the fourth son in a family of seven. His family was originally bourgeois but claimed noble roots. He left Castelmore for Paris around 1630, adopting the name D'Artagnan at that point. He began his military career as a cadet in the French guards and participated in various military operations from 1640 to 1642. He became a musketeer of the king around 1644 with backing from Cardinal Mazzarino and served in various capacities during the Fronde, undertaking secret missions for the cardinal. D'Artagnan's loyalty to King Louis XIV led to him holding important posts, including captain of the musketeers themselves in a role in the detention of the uh, ex-superintendent Nicolas Fouquet. By the end of his career, 
he was governor of Lille, that I, as we've seen, being uh, expugnated by the, the same musketeers, and was called back into active duty during the war against the Dutch. So he dies, as we'll see better now, uh, from a gunshot wound during uh, an engagement while attempting to rescue a comrade, apparently. There are also different versions, but... His body was reportedly left on the battlefield, and the location of his burial remains thus unknown, with multiple legions existing about his final resting place. D'Artagnan was married to Anne-Charlotte de Jean Lessy and had two sons, uh, both of whom pursued military careers. His life and exploit are naturally uh, as later romanticized by Alexandre Dumas, who created the fictional character based on him in, in the works like The Three Musketeers, introducing a blend of history and fiction that further entrenched D'Artagnan's place in pop culture. Uh, in France, there are lots of monuments to him, and this is really a uh, quite interesting blend, in fact, of actual military historical record for, from a day and age that, let's say, uh, was also relatively forgotten within the same France, and that was kept alive, however, by... Uh, such great and beautiful literary work. So, what was happening at Maastricht? Basically, the French were assaulting um, uh, this half moon fortification. Maastricht, as you know, is a fortress city strategically located along the Mons River, making it a crucial objective uh, at the time of the French King Louis XIV's campaign to enhance his territorial claims in the region. By the way, the siege was masterfully orchestrated by the illustrious French engineer Sébastien Leprestre de Vauban. I made a video about him and his famous fortificatory system dominating the 18th century uh, and of course also these previous times uh, uh, so quickly after him. He's actually the greatest military engineer in history, if you think about that. If anything, for the, the gigantic work and fort, like how many forts were built by him as a as a chain to defend France successfully, so by the way, um, he um, was also a commander and who employed innovative siege tactics that would influence, in fact, the mil military strategies for, for centuries. Right? It was still in the 19th century when many principles um, dating from his works were um, still applied. And it was during the siege of Maastricht that Vauban's concept of the siege parallel was first practically implemented, allowing for a systematic approach to besieging fortified positions. As the French forces encircled the city, with Louis XIV taking a hands-on approach, he sought not only a military victory but also a grand display of royal power, visiting the trenches and indulging in the pageantry of warfare. The French army, bolstered by an allied brigade, as we've seen, of English, but also Scottish troops, uh, as per the, given that, of course, like the uh, the Stuarts were kings of both uh, realms, uh, as per the Treaty of Dover, initially faced a, a well-fortified garrison of about 5,000 Dutch defenders, led by Jacques de Ferriot. However, years of neglect had taken their toll on the fortifications, rendering them vulnerable. As artillery fire rained down and trench work progressed, violence and chaos erupted within the city as both sides engaged in fierce combat. Notably, the musketeers, including D'Artagnan himself, fought valiantly during the assault, with the musketeer company suffering heavy casualties, a testament to their courage amid intense opposition. The offensive culminated in a series of brutal assaults on the Tongaren Gate, where D'Artagnan famously met his fate on that June the 25th, delivering a poignant reminder of the high stakes of such confrontations. Despite fierce resistance, the overwhelming numbers and sophisticated tactics employed by the French forced the Dutch to gradually concede ground. As pressure mounted, the Dutch garrison's morale faltered, fueled by the threat of a retribution and the prospect of a second mass sacking, reminiscent of the historical siege of 1579, because these had, from exactly that, that second half of the 16th century, become 
at, at least more intensely that, that they had already been before, like the um, uh, at this point probably the most uh, uh, tormented battlefield uh, of Europe. Uh, eventually, as the French batteries intensified their bombardment and breaches in the fortifications became apparent, the Dutch were compelled to negotiate their surrender. On June the 30th, De Favreau capitulated in established terms that spared the city from looting, allowing the garrison to withdraw under honorable conditions, but marking a significant blow to Dutch military pride. Uh, in the aftermath, the fall of Maastricht allowed Louis the Fourteenth to further ambitions and prompted shifts in the broader international landscape as alliances formed and public sentiments in neighboring regions was incited. Louis sought to immortalize the victory with celebrations and artistic representations, including paintings by Charles Le Brun uh, and reliefs depicting the siege, emphasizing the triumph of his reign. However, the quick success at Maastricht also ignited a broader coalition among the Dutch, Spanish and various German states, leading to prolonged uh, warfare that would eventually necessitate the return of the city to the Dutch in the 1678 Treaty of Nijmegen, further illustrating the shifting tides of war and diplomacy in the 17th century. But going back to D'Artagnan, we have an interesting uh, you know, uh, text provided by Lord Ellington that was in the aforementioned British contingent and actively himself engaged in the fighting that was also quoted in Churchill's own Marlborough given that, as you know, the, the British Prime Minister was in fact di a direct descendant of uh, such uh, military genius. The story tells us this. There was Monsieur Artagnan with his musketeers who fought bravely. This gentleman had a notable reputation in the French army. He might have dissuaded the Duke of Monmouth from passing through this area, but it was not feasible. So this gentleman accompanied him. As they navigated the narrow passage, D'Artagnan was shot in the head and killed. At that moment, the Duke and we uh, uh, we successfully crossed, while M Mr. O'Brien sustained a gunshot wound to his legs. The soldiers drew strength from this, with the Duke leading them with great courage. When His Grace noticed that the enemy was beginning to retreat, he was uh, encouraged to withdraw to the trench to better execute his commands as necessary. He then dispatched Mr. Villard to the King Louis XIV to request 500 fresh troops and to report on the situation. When the reinforcements arrived, our enemies left us without further disturbance, allowing us to take uh, control of the territory we had captured by night. Thus, to the Duke's immense honor, we not only captured more than expected, but also retained it, albeit at the cost of many men and several valiant officers. And it's a pretty typical description of this, in fact, pretty intense uh, siege and trench warfare we've seen with actual uh, marksmen waiting to, to target exactly this, this officers uh, with all these corners. And, you know, and that was the point of the new, um, the new fortifications by Vauban to allow for essentially a safer approach to the to the enemy uh, battlements uh, without being in fact targeted by enfilade fire however certain uh, certain gaps were, were remaining open that were quite risky and you can imagine the general you know uh, chaos of, of the situation uh, and so uh, actually the, the aforementioned demi lune was eventually taken after a, a charge led by the same king's musketeers resulting in the capitulation of Maastricht. So that's how D'Artagnan died, right? Part of a major uh, action, right? Uh, in an operation designed, in fact, to properly break uh, once for all the Dutch resistance in the 
in the city. And this marked also a fitting conclusion for the hero in the, the arms of glory that inspired Alexandre Dumas uh, and so made part uh, D'Artagnan's legion. So the, the war also continued. This was predictably marked uh, by further sieges as we were observing the same polyurcetic proven it in its development, especially in this flatland that had to uh, with lots of rivers um, and, and strategic strong points that um, afforded this further entrenchment, this further fortification. Areas further south along France's eastern borders were basically all invested by this. In March 1674, the king's musketeers executed a bold attack that leads to the capture of Vesançon, uh, where they managed to take a section of its fortifications. You always see them involved in these breakthrough operations, as you would expect truly from the elite. Right? Uh, it's uh, not much a matter of pitch battles uh, anymore from quite some time, like the 16th and 17th century had witnessed the statization of, um, of warfare through, through sieges and the large development of the ever more complex plans of the, of the strongholds and their defenses. Um, however, this was reflected also in the, the open field engagement, as we will see later, because there is an attempt to break this sort of deadlock, right? We talked about it, uh, especially in the video about Vauban, how, of course, there are way more sieges than in field battles, but the latter are also very meaningful. And in fact, they have this strategic... Uh, they, they are preferred, right? In, also by the military minds, the same Marlborough, other great figures of for the French side, and you have Prince Eugene, that are really want to push for open confrontations because, yes, they are riskier in a sense, but they allow you to make more direct progress if succeeding. Uh, and so also bypassing many fortresses that without a uh, major force protecting them are easier to, if anything, to, to besiege if you, um, if you have to. And so as tough the forces uh, must be in, in open ground, they have to be in a close one. So the, uh, the, the versatility also like forces are able, for example, to the, fully deployed, effective combined armed tactics in, in open field, that is the place of election for that, uh, adapt uh, in the same way because there are the same forces in, in sieges. And so as in open field, you'll see that the musketeers are used to, to break through. So it's the case during sieges, right? Uh, they are not simply wasted during the most attritional phase of, let's say, the the least strategically eventful attritional phase of the siege, you can't have like just line infantry holding the the outer trenches. But when you have to attack a section that you think is going like as we've seen the demi lune of Maastricht, chosen for for the, this purpose uh, to make the entire uh, enemy uh, resistance collapse, well, you do really need this enormous effort we've seen with which kind, like quantity and quality of casualties, uh, that requires also that kind of leadership and that kind of skill, as we already pointed out. At Condé, in 1676, both um, musketeers' companies made a daring night assault. We are on April the 25th, 26th, breaching the defenses and allowing infantry grenadiers to follow closely behind, which also in this case resulted in the city's swift surrender. This is quite interesting because the grenadiers were considered like, like the true uh, stormtroopers, right? And the, the musketeers are the spearhead of this formation that allows for more, that greater uh, grenadier firepower to be poured in and to, to smash everything. Uh, but the veritable breakthrough is carried out by the musketeers. And so at that point, you must understand how 
qualitative this force really was. The following year, you witness an, an even greater recognition for for the king's musketeers as a wall, thanks to their extraordinary bravery once again displayed at Valenciennes, an action that uh, really remained famous in their military annals. Essentially, in the spring of 1677, the French army under the Sun King laid siege to the fortified city of Valenciennes in Flanders. On March the 9th, Marshal de Luxembourg arrived to begin constructing trenches on the city's northern side. The strong defensive structures of Valenciennes indicated that capturing the city would likely be a prolonged and violent process, as usual, um, and at 9 a.m. of March the 17th, there is an initial assault on the outer fortifications. That was just the, the beginning of the same, and spearheaded by grenadiers from the guard regiments, so these were also quite elite, with the backing from two companies of the King's Musketeers and the Picardy Regiment. Drew to their reputation for bravery, the Musketeers swiftly took control of the Half Moon fort that overlooked the surrounding defenses. You see always more or less the same tactical objectives. And King Louis, watching from afar, was both astonished and pleased to see his scarlet-coated troops triumphantly holding the outer works. Consider also the fact that the Sun King was notoriously creating the design and color for the musketeer's uniforms himself, adding to his personal satisfaction. He cared extremely since childhood uh, that his guards would uh, be uh, like perfect also from an aesthetical point of view inspectioning them uh, regularly and having a quite again you know also a discreet taste considering what in fact this this uniforms really look like and the sense of standard right and uh, Louis XIV as you know wasn't much of a commander at all but for the rest he was an enormous military mind he single-handedly created again a modern national army the modern national army um, and set some fundamental standards uh, accompanying the French military for for centuries so um, this was not over yet because the musketeers then charged across a narrow bridge over the moat driving back its defenders to enter the half moon redoubt where fierce close combat answered right that's where you would see what people were actually made of. Some members of the first company found an additional narrow bridge leading to a sally port and successfully overcame its guards. The boldest among them climbed a staircase, clearing enemy soldiers from the area and reaching the ramparts of Valenciennes, thereby entering the city itself. Despite a counterattack from the defenders, the musketeers then took up defensive positions with some seeking shelter nearby houses while others stationed themselves on the seized wall. Uh, they were essentially exhausted. They had really displayed that aggressive capacity. They would literally eat like the, the, the fortifications up together with the, the enemies in them. Um, t- uh, however, that's the point where reinforcements uh, arrived from the second company relatively soon, uh, followed by the guards and Picardy regiments that joined the fray. Uh, and this really turns the, the tides, because the uh, remainder of the French army took advantage of the breach. You see how it was done. Like, the best troops, we've seen it also at Suez, etc. The best forces break through, and then all the others pour in. Um, and so it was just all about this diamond force, um, and the musketeers being a quintessential element of the same. So at that point, the city's governor, realizing that the French were pouring in in an uncontrolled way, I mean, still the defenders were fighting, but essentially the defenses were collapsing, in order to prevent chaos and looting, decided to surrender, so that that process could be uh, more regulated, 
Um, and of course, the significant achievement was largely due to the braver displayed by the king's musketeers. And so again, Valenciennes, great, uh, great episode in their history. Less than a month later, by the way, on April the 11th, 1677, the musketeers joined French forces outside Kassel, where they faced the Dutch of the Prince of Orange's infantry, who had previously pushed the French cavalry back twice. Ordered to resume the attack, the musketeers dismounted, advanced on foot, and broke through the enemy formation. Taking advantage of this, the French infantry advanced to finish the engagement, while the musketeers returned to their horses to await further commands. So, the, you, know, you know, never mind what we just did, we are still expandable. This is a, a very uh, eloquent indicator, incredibly high quality, because after an engagement like that, like very few units would be able to, say, at least keep operating again. And you see what happens in open field here. The musketeers do essentially the same thing. There is a bit sort of more initial testing against the enemy forces, as if you would do on a siege after all. And then after having spot the tougher block that doesn't want to break, you send in, uh, in this balance odds, your elite that manages to break through and allows the, the rest of the forces to put enough pressure to make the enemies collapse. By the way, the king's brother, uh, Philip, uh, witnessed the event and noted that the two companies of musketeers had been instrumental in achieving victory, of course, and the further distinguished musketeers accumulated uh, further uh, successes of this kind described at the sieges of Ypres. Courtre, Philipsburg, Mont, Namur. So basically, everywhere they went, they they really just think about as a as a core, like what kind of experience was matured by these repeated uh, efforts and success at large. There was then a brief period of peace, uh, interrupted only in 1691, when. Predictably, the king's musketeers were once again called to assault the heavily fortified Mont. Their enthusiasm to charge was so intense that a royal command was issued. Any musketeer who advanced beyond his line would be shot by his lieutenant. This tells you also how there was no favoritism. The quality of such elite units went in parallel with the most obvious, like, if you disobey, I shoot you. But this is how commanders well, it's there's not a martial court or whatever, like you know, that the, the officers shoot you on the spot. This was done by everybody at the time. We know it from Prince Eugene, we know it from Mauer. It, it, it is really uh, normal and it, it does work, but it also tells you how hyper loaded and overly fanatic and excessively exalted these men were, what it meant at this point to be a musketeer of the king after all this major feats and tradition was accumulating now after almost a century of glory. Peace came back in 1697. It went away again in 1702. During the latter war, the French faced substantial defeats in Flanders against two giants of military history that are the aforementioned Duke of Marlborough and uh, Prince Eugene. Uh, you know the context, we will resume, I, I will make a video about, or a series actually about the age of Marlborough because we didn't talk too much about British warfare during this period. Also I want to resume one about Prince Eugene, in any case we have also to tell a lot about the French in general. I made a video about uh, Maurice de Saxe last year that is really worth uh, watching to realize. But also, in fact, just at, at the highest levels, not just of politics, but also military history, like Europe was. Um, now, the marshals serving the Sun King during this newer wars proved essentially mediocre until Billard uh, emerged as a capable commander. I gave you some answers 
in the question and answer videos about uh, the Battle of Mount Plaquet. Uh, it should be pointed out that unlike Napoleon's marshals, the Sun King's generals were capable of preserving France from collapse and defeat. There is uh, a general character that you can attribute also to how uh, Louis XIV would select uh, French leadership. Louis XIV was a very cold, stout, very, as you know, calculating, um, irremovable in individual. Um, so he, he would take a cold approach, right? You didn't have to get overly enthusiastic. You didn't have to dare too much. Napoleon's conversely instead was a sort of, you know, little Caesar, like he had a um, great idea of uh, of himself. He was an incredibly bold, dashing commander, and so basically his generals turned out to be. Except, again, the French uh, were not invaded under the Sun King, whereas Napoleon, uh, but going much more beyond, at least, however, in quite different times, quite different circumstances. Uh, than what Louis XIV did, in, at least in, in, on the map of Europe, did witness, say, the Cossacks entering Paris. Now, um, this um, times at the beginning of the 18th century, especially with the uh, not just the right the leadership of such distinguished enemies like Churchill and the Savoie Carignano, but also the aforementioned development of very qualitative Dutch um, and English uh, firepower doctrines really put a lot of pressure uh, on the French. So for, for the musketeers, these were very challenging times. In spite of their unwavering bravery, it was surely a uh, display. At the Battle of Ramilly on May the 20th, 1706, the king's musketeers charge alongside the Royal Guard Cavalry, initially breaking through four enemy lines, which is insane. This tells you how prepotently, by the way, cavalry had come back on the battlefields and how uh, a versatile force the musketeers were. Like, their mounted component was definitely uh, a shock one together with the guard, the Maison de Roi, uh, all together, and this reveals to you again how medieval still this kind of warfare really was, how uh, truly feudal uh, in nature this French aristocratic cavalry in particular s still felt and and and, uh, and believed themselves to be, and as they actually were. However, times were changing indeed, and infantry was the most important of the arms. Marlborough exploited Marshal Villeroy's tactical mistakes at Ramilly, flanking the French forces and launching a counter-offensive. And so, despite the musketeers and the guardmen's uh, valiant efforts, the French infantry ultimately collapsed and retreated in disarray. And without that, you can't really uh, operate. The guards are important here, remember. There are, the musketeers are not the only element of the guard. It's a very composite, again, still very feudal and non-uniformed um, set of, of forces that flourish, however, under this true escalation in, in, in the art of war. Right? It's sort of ridiculous, not just to hear the term military revolution, but to notice that this was forged um, for a period that basically is just like the early modern age and stopping to the mid 17th century, it is actually the moment in which warfare literally escalates. Like, if you really want to talk about a revolutionary phase, if anything, the, la the later phase is the, the the most important one. Nevertheless, then you have all these again in names tied to incredibly grim battles. If anything, for the uh, escalatingly massive amount of men involved. We're talking uh, altogether hundreds of thousands. Essentially, it's not until the Napoleonic Wars that you will see something similar and with very different army structures by then. This is the war of the Spanish succession. As you know, after that, uh, all armies started posing themselves some question because doctrinally speaking, it was evident that such massive efforts on the battlefield, even in the aforementioned uh, 
attempt to break this uh, deadlock provided by, say, the, the ever more effective fortifications that were sucking so many resources just to, and for for an entire campaign, right, and buying time, etc., uh, required some sort of greater uh, maneuver, some kind of now that it could be in fact achieved through concentrating forces was however untenable on the long run it, it, it was just uh, financially destructive uh, say aside from the military history we we say manualistically think okay so this is 18th century say early 18th century france um we do not hear of revolutions right revolutions happen later at the end of the century there are under louis the 14th at least three four occasions in which actual revolutions would were about to take place or had already started because of this massive strains uh, on the system. And also this kind of incredibly delicate battles. Uh, Audenard was a, a tough one. The French were defeated. At Malplaquet, you have something different. Um, this is September the 11th, 1709. The French basically lose the battle. At least, uh, conventionally speaking, they would draw. They, so the the, the Allies achieve some uh, result in that sense, but the fact that the the French army retreated in good order after the defeats of the previous years spirits them so much, basically this turns into a French victory because they understand that on the longer run the Allies cannot uh, keep that base without basically running out of resources. Um, at Malplaquet, specifically, the Royal Guard cavalry, including the King's Musketeers, charged Marlborough's cavalry four times. There are lots of backs and forths in this. It's a very intense, like, muscle to muscle. Um, and causing, in fact, the, uh, the Allies to fall back to, towards their infantry. And this, again, a, a hell of a, a question military culture displayed. So once again, mistakes in tactics rather lead to the French army's eventual withdrawal. That again, however, is a general is perceived as a general victory to which the same King's Musketeers on horseback had contributed to. Uh, then, after the War of Spanish Succession that finishes in 1713-14, well, there are other wars in between, but it's, this is not say the, the issue. Lots of various conflicts overlapping, there is, because of the aforementioned exhaustion of resources, a long period of relative tranquility. So there are also less battles uh, that the, the king's musketeers, together with, with the French armies of war, took part in. However, some are important. For example, the siege and surrender of Felixburg in July 1734, Another significant deployment of the Mousquetaire de la Maison du Roi is at Dettingen, 1743. Once again, on these occasions, they faced superior enemy tactics, with British cavalry in particular surrounding the Maison du Roi, which was a big deal. Uh, the second company of the King's Musketeers was engaged in intense combat, resulting in 29 deaths and 57 injuries. Sir, so these were elite forces, so even though the armies were big, still, it's it's not to be. And just like normally, these forces were safeguarded, like they would be able to withdraw. Um, and such high toll comes, in fact, with the loss of a standard that, of course, was. Uh, a, a terrible calamity for the unit's reputation in general. Now, this battle, talking that again, inflicted severe financial hardship uh, on the surviving musketeers as well. I mean, as a model, again, the say warfare was evolving towards something less sort of um, feudal household like. Um, there is a, a a literal loss during the campaign. I could say the, the surviving musketeers had largely lost, for example, their privately purchased horses and weapons, which 
as you see here, it was still a matter of, it's a bit like at Versailles. If you wanted to be part of it, you had to largely, you know, sustain yourself. You were, you were only partly maintained by, by the king. And this reveals also how up to that point, like the, uh, the, the participation to this elite unit just drew so many noblemen to it. Um, but we should point out that even at that thing again, each musketeer displayed extraordinary bravery. For example, it took 15 saber strikes and several gunshots to finally subdue Marshal de Logitessy. Uh, so these men were real fighters. Um, they were that seriously committed and they were just embodying some of the most fulgid uh, levels of European military superiority. Now, during that thing again, there is also a notable incident occurring. It is the king's musketeer, Philippe de Girardot de Malassis, wounded by a saber strike to the head lay unconscious when discovered by British soldiers who carried him to the Duke of Cumberland's tent. And so the Duke, son of King George II, had also been wounded in the leg. Uh, so, but seeing upon Girardot insisted that his surgeon attend to him first because he understood, of course, that he was in much critical situation. You can see the gallantry that nobleman exchanged at this point. So a, tri uh, a truly chivalric uh, time still. And perhaps exactly thanks to this, Girardot ultimately recovered. Field Marshal Darlimpo, the Earl of Stair, further ordered that surgeons tend to the other wounded guardsmen. This is typical of the lace wars of the period. Uh, in many ways, um, you do not see it having happened much later. Uh, there are many reasons for this, and of course, consider this is always an elite that is basically backing each other. Like this kind of chivalric behavior uh, on the battlefields was functional also to recognize their establishment at home as the real gentlemen, as the real aristocrats that truly knew what this business of war was but still felt truly a, a sort of king's sport, right, where these units were meant to, in fact, train all their lives to defend their countries and, and especially uh, monarchs' uh, prerogatives. Uh, and so training all, all their lives with great, in fact, uh, expenses we've seen for eventually proving how qualitatively valid they were on the battlefield. So everything um, is, is to be found there, of course, episodes in many other aspects, but they regrettably seem to have become ever rarer um, to this day. And that has to do, of course, with the same extraction of, of the soldier to begin with. Um, now, two years after that thing again, you have the great comeback under the Marshal Maurice de Saxe, the Battle of Fontenoy. Uh, we will have to make more videos about 18th century warfare because it feels like we haven't properly began to talk about it seriously. And Fontenoy is one of those battles, May the 11th, 1745, that really uh, marked like an era, like a, a time, especially mid 18th century, that smiled to the French thanks to this uh, very curious figure. Uh, Essentially, a very similar one in the, the, the enormous amount of power, if anything, gathered uh, previously by, by Marlborough, that is, in fact, the son of, as you know, a Protestant, he's actually a Protestant himself, um, German ruler that comes to serve the French and basically gives them the splendid victories, of which Fontenoise is really the greatest one. Um, the Royal Guard cavalry is, of course, deployed in this yet another Flemish campaign. We are, of course, in the time of Louis XV, for, also from quite a while. And uh, so you have the king attending the battle with his son, the Dauphin, and, of course, the the, the facto commander uh, in chief, the Marshal Maurice de Saxe. Fontenoy 
uh, witnesses the, the French facing the Duke of Cumberland's allied forces, composed predictably by this essentially British, Dutch and German mix. The Battle of Fontenoy is not just a great French victory, but one that is connected with the legendary bravery of the Royal Guard Cavalry. It really wins uh, the day in this very closely uh, fought uh, engagement. And so it's important to discuss it a bit more in, in depth. You have the French, uh, 50,000 troops. Louis XV uh, is there politically, informally. This is the War of the Austrian Succession. In the mid-18th century, you have even more overlapping wars telling the truth um, in a broader political and also military sense. The British, the Dutch, and the Germans of the Duke of Cumberland were 53,000. Fontenoy is just a, a village, right? In, in, in Flanders. Uh, now, the, this had been the actually the place, as you know, Carolingian history of a very bloody battle uh, back in the day, but say, as many of these names of famous battles, there isn't in fact really anything there, it's just tragedy that comes to confer to, to these locations a, a meaning that is contingent to that political wrestling. Now, the French. Um, had seized the village and, and the Duke of Cumberland was determined to capture it which had it occurred basically the French uh, would have lost the French as we've seen are slightly outnumbered it's not a major divide however they have two major advantages over the Allies instead first of all there is this morale boosting factor that both the king and the Dauphin are present. Marshal de Saxe is the second, like such a brilliant military strategist uh, that uh, really was capable of inspiring the troops. In spite of the fact that he was ill at the time, uh, this wouldn't prevent him to think sharply and you know, following his clear vision he was a man of enormous physical resistance, as a matter of fact. He was said to be able to bend a horseshoe with, with his bare hands. The Duke of Cumberland concentrated, in order to achieve his goal, his finest infantry into a powerful column of at least 10,000 men. We discussed the Lexata question of the column and the line, which is not just something occurring in the Grand Carrel of the late 19th century, not even just in the French Royal Army. Linear tactics that by this point have fully developed are still presenting, in spite of course of the essentially the fact of the linear uh, prevalence, this, this opportunity of funneling the troops into like with a narrower front into some strategic locations and essentially pushing just with the uh, with the posterior ranks uh, and if the allies wanted in fact to seize Fontenot they had to concentrate forces uh, in this way the battle began with this uh, habitual bravado associated with the lace wars uh, the French guard infantry confronts the British guards and there is this moment in which Essentially, the, the French boldly invite the British to initiate the first attack, the first volley. There's all a, actually a doctrinal reason behind that. It's not mere chivalry. It, it, it would seem like that. It was intended like that. But some said that essentially uh, the, um, said it was an advantage, even considering the incredibly low amount of actual uh, you know, bullets causing lethal damage. Um, a sort of advantage of allowing the enemy to fire first to disorder their ranks earlier because there was this sort of crazy mechanical uh, behavior that, stemming from training that it, that also was kind of very logical in the sense that pouring as much fire as you could against the enemy given that it was more or less a zone fire not a precise one also because after the first volley there was a a mist of fog that wouldn't show you anything. So that if 
you by that point like the the enemy would have started disorganizing itself before if you had an intact formation that had taken maybe some casualty but had not started this crazy um race um you would have essentially had a paradoxically greater effect by the first orderly volleys on this order disorder in it's very speculative but some in talking this famous gallantry apparently gallantry episode was um said it was pointed out as well in any case the the acts were really that chivalry uh, and actually, like to prove how brutal this was, so how also consciously, because the officers doing, say, asking for this first shot were the ones in the first line, like the British volley quickly decimated the front line of the French troops. And so the thing did not work at all, apparently, under different accounts, but at the end of the day, uh, the British prevail. And so their column adva- does advance. However, despite facing counterattacks from the French, the British momentum kept continuing. Uh, and so the French are in a tough time. Conversely, the French do not leave Fontenoy. The British cannot break through. And so what happens is that the British column, in the process, uh, grows denser, ever more cramped, um, and so pushing, so that the French are actually starting to crack. However, they play really this great uh, reserves, um, effort, and combined arms uh, tactics. And they reorganize several battalions. They bring artillery to target the advancing British. That because of their that deep formation take uh, devastating losses. Imagine, you know, shooting a column um, with, of course, um, even ten uh, of ranks deep, and you know, all these red packed red coats being uh, struck down like in, in a bowling uh, alley, except you know, with pieces of human beings flying everywhere. Um, and this is how crudely brutal the, this whole thing is. It's still not enough yet because artillery is not actually so uh, resolutive at all. Uh, in fact, this is when the guard must intervene. That's essentially the last resort. If you employ that elite, is the last uh, expendable force. All the others are absorbed to stop the British who are about to break through. So the reserve cavalry of the guards charges... At the enemy column, that is essentially stuck into that hellish confrontation, both companies of the King's Musketeers join the fight, uh, with each musketeer really eager for, for combat. And so, in this marvelous confrontation, swords unseated, the musketeers, along with their fellow soldiers and the entire guard cavalry, initially advanced a, a trot, then moved to canter. And so in the last 100 meters of so- uh, surge forward at full gallop into the enemy call. You have to maintain cohesion, right? This is not just about attacking, of course, the column per se from a different angle. This is about making the effort of that uh, elite cavalry, right? In spite of the larger numbers, of the enemy like felt on it and and so basically this shock impact of the overwhelming cavalry charge breaks the British lines they start wavering and uh, when French infantry presses on like because much less pressure now is put on it the British formation is effectively shattered right uh, the British battalions actually do manage to regroup around their collars, allowing for some organized retreat. Great coordination there as well, but also because the column was just a part of the army as a wall, and it's basically this massive shock uh, that arrives from the guard and the musketeers uh, that uh, basically 
wins the day for France. Uh, and so there are other positive uh, endeavors carried out by the Guard Cavalry, uh, continuing in Flanders until 1748. Then, again, wars on the continent become relatively uh, sp sparser by ever more punching, of course. The Seven Years' War witnessed uh, some engagement, but only after 1761 for the Musketeers when they uh, join Marshal Soubise's army operating in the lower Rhineland. However, there aren't many notable clashes, right? So this uh, year, 1761, actually, as sadly after all, marks the last year of actual campaign for the King's Musketeers, right? Uh, after that, again, there is all uh, a history of more or less of representative value and of course actual practical um, you know function uh, but the descent the, the, the days of, of glory the, the moment of greatest um, capacities under the Sun King are past and and so Europe has also changed the world has changed tactics um, if anything, it's not much that have changed. Uh, the the musketeers come to be still in a moment of transition from pike and shot to uh, to to linear warfare. The latter is prevalent now, but let's say the proportions between the various arms is changing, and the types of employment are changing. The same model that this Maison de, uh, de Roi and and the in fact the same extraction of musketeers changed. Uh, France is starting to boil from the within because of this immense imba imbalance within the same hundreds of years of um, in fact of a systemic compression of the lower estates, especially now the third one that had expanded further also thanks to the same monarchic subtle development and that wants to have more to say in the system. You have these periodical imbalances uh, uh, you know, increasingly high uh, public debt that is connected also to the increasing French interventions. Think about the ones that famously would, I mean, during the Seven Years' War uh, and during the, especially also the the American War of Independence, you have the still essentially pre-industrial so uh, societies, uh, systemic swings for bad harvests, uh, changing you know, unstable markets, let's say, that affect the peasantry. That is still the the bulk of, after all, the also especially France is such a vastly fertile and agricultural country. Like this massive Atlantic plains full of major rivers and very fertile soil. So uh, this had literally fed the entire system. And um, we have talked a lot about the revolutionary and Napoleonic armies. Uh, it feels like we have just begun because it is really the case and that's why I have to talk especially much more about 18th century warfare because we, have, we haven't really covered it in that level, level of detail that uh, it really deserves but uh, I thought that talking about musketeers was the right move um, to start if anything because there is this quite early beginning and it arrives in fact towards the end of it's almost two centuries of military history um, and that also bring a bit more on, on the for like French military culture that I don't think is uh, if you ask me like in this period which is the most interesting of course, is of course it, it's overall the French I mean the, the standard set by the French the, the general uh, hegemonic nature of France and Europe like required this enormous um, attention uh, that you know, you, you can look at the Prussians and say, "Oh my God, yes, they were qualitative, yes, but we were qualitative in relation also to the fact that they were a smaller country that was struggling to survive." And so, uh, what France had done already uh, in the second half of the 17th century is states like Austria and Prussia start achieving basically just by the mid 18th, and 
there is so much in this type i wouldn't know what to search uh say search uh 18th century french warfare you see there isn't even warfare it's just like the army and here you have oh my god seriously hornblower 18th century military music brutal battle this is actually i think uh just a silly movie uh just military marches songs but Napoleonic stuff, there is zero here about 18th century French warfare in the way I intended. Uh, Maurice de Saxe, the, say, the great war, the great battles of the beginning of the say, French musketeers history, if it is what you should look at. Who were the three musketeers based? This is why I hate. Um, YouTube and this, this Saint Roman history, the real three musketeers, 16 minutes. Okay, if it is just about that, but is there anything else? Like it's just on the three musketeers, not on the actual musketeers. Um, in a like this video, for example, you can't find anything on YouTube, just movies about musketeers, and this is so uh, so crazy. There is a, a battle, of course video about Fontenoy, which is okay, but you see here it's the very fabric of reference that is lost, that is absent. You don't really find that, and it, it, it's disturbing. I mean, if you really want to appreciate something, like if I make this video, for example, I, I'm sure that I will not receive... Um, much remember here like the armchair historian 10 minutes long video about why did soldiers fighting lines 1 million views <laughs> what the hell man like you know for 1 million views this should be the greatest explanation of how, of how of like how you can properly have a, a lesson on it and understanding the most obvious reasons behind. you can't make 10 minutes videos and pretend that this million views are going to make people more intelligent that's not how it works right you must cultivate military culture and unfortunately this is the, uh, the the reality in which we live I try naturally to explain things but when you make I don't know these carefully researched videos you make also the one about Vauban you realize people just don't watch and the question is yeah I understand you you don't have to I understand that uh, I speak in the way I do that there is no major here visual entertainment or whatever but the question is what what is that you want exactly do you, you don't want still to learn anything anyhow like uh you watch these videos and then you read piles of books uh it turns out people don't actually read that much at all nor seem to be particular the in, the major indicator is just the type of feedback that I so indirectly the feedback that I receive regarding such thing. The point being, let's be honest guys, like you can if at least I come from a from a past in which knowing this stuff made you uh let's say hopefully like a like the, the, this information is put in this way was sought after. You know, people wanted to know, people wanted to fascinate themselves with that. And I realize, especially at this time of the year, so there is the U.S. elections coming and all this stuff. But say, can we be honest regarding what is military historical quality? And yes, I'm bragging about Facebook, of course, but we must be very honest. I think I'm pretty stern, but also pretty fair regarding my uh, judgment uh, criteria for today. Nevertheless, I stop it here. We will naturally keep talking about the the musketeers. If you're interested in something more, also, um, you know, in uh, that that idea actually was who was sent Roman sent the actual real musketeers. Well, it's more like biographies of single officers. It's not this great deal, but say those things can be nice if anything because I like Dumas. That's why <laughs> that was actually a good idea. But in general, like we will keep talking about even the single battles that we looked at today. There's so much just I mean Fontenoy, the siege of Candia, all the battles of the, the wars of Spanish succession. I mean, these are major things, right? It's it's not just like 
little stuff. I'm glad we are, if anything, I, I wanted to see uh, French warfare, my, my, uh, latest modern French warfare, how big is that? 14 videos, only 190 views of the playlist. Well, it's a pity because there is actually pretty damn good content. Admittedly, yes, it's only 14 videos, but let's be honest here. Uh, the videos are much more... Um, so they would deserve much more views. Here, some did get it, but others so-so. In any case, as I was saying for today, stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like. Or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content for today. I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.